Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bulbanek School of Government. My name is Callum Miller. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Associate Dean, and it's um, a great pleasure to welcome you here. I'm particularly grateful to you, those of you here in person, not the, those of you who are watching us online, uh, for fighting through the snow in Oxford to be here this evening. Um, I'm sure that this evening's discussion will merit that uh, bravery, but thank you very much for doing it. Um, the Blavatnik School uh, was, is an institution devoted to finding out what works in government and public policy and to using and sharing that knowledge to help policymakers improve the lives of citizens. And tonight we're dealing with some of the central themes uh, relating to that mission. How states are built, what impact external parties have on state development and what role aid plays in the building of fragile states. And it's our huge pleasure to have uh, our colleague and friend, uh, Namat Bazan, presenting his work. Uh, Namat is here for his second visit to the Blavatnik School, currently as a research fellow. For in 2015, he was here as a Global Leaders Fellow as part of the program led by the Global Economic Governance Program. And Namat, it's wonderful to have had you here working with us uh, over that period. Um, Namat will be talking about his book, Aid Paradoxes in Afghanistan, Building and Undermining the State. Um, I'm not going to say very much more. I'm going to allow him to come and present uh, the main themes of the book to you. Um, just to give you a brief word on how we plan to organise our time this evening, after Namath's spoken, we'll have a bit of chance for you to ask any clarificatory questions. If there are any facts or bits of information you would like to gather, uh, there'll be an opportunity for that then. And then our uh, other two speakers, who I will introduce at the time, will then respond a little bit to the arguments in the book, and then we'll open up to hear more from you about your opinions. So we really do want this to be a dialogue. We try to structure it so that there will be plenty of opportunity for you to ask your questions and express your your views. Uh, but now, without further ado, I'd like to invite Namat to come up and present the arguments in his book. Please. Uh, Callum, thank you so much and uh, for your kind remarks and it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I'm so honored to discuss my book with uh, uh, Mr. Ludin, a former colleague. We worked together in Afghanistan uh, on reconstruction of the country and also uh, Stefan. Uh, and also our uh, wonderful audience, thanks for being here in this wonderful weather of Oxford today. <laughs> uh, we have a number of countries that are uh, uh, suffering from interdependent uh, feelings, uh, which are not on track uh, towards uh, sustainable economic development, have citizens who live in fear, and which cannot uh, deliver services. Over a billion people live in, in this situation, we, which we call it fragility. And uh, the efforts, uh, despite the increasing attention to reduce fragility, the efforts have not been uh, successful. What I have uh, been trying to do in this book to unpack this problem by looking at one of the most challenging uh, and dynamic places in the world, Afghanistan after 2001. So one of the questions is, uh, uh, why Afghanistan? Uh, well, uh, what, what happened after uh, 2001 or 9-11, uh, uh, both in terms of the intervention and the conditions on the ground, uh, we, Afghanistan had a weak and fragmented institutions, making it uh, challenging for the state building process. In this work, I have tried to look at how the existing um, Institution, public institutions were strengthened, new ones were created, uh, in particular by looking at how um, donors supported government reforms to improve the taxation system, how the government reorganized the state fiscal management system, and how a particular form of aid dependency which Afghanistan endured, uh, including over-reliance on off-budget aid which bypassed the state, and uh, national mechanisms um, affected the state and society, what I call it fiscal relationship. In terms of the findings or key arguments of the book, um, 
Three key findings uh, have emerged from this study. Two is related to the process of state building, especially in Afghanistan, and one to uh, theory of state building and uh, a state society fiscal relationship. The first one, I would like to uh, focus on, uh, on the first two and uh, um, on the conclusions uh, of the book. Uh, I found that there has been a path dependency uh, in the process of uh, state building in Afghanistan. A number of factors affected the state building uh, since mid 18th century, but uh, the reliance of governments on external sources of revenue in the form of tributes, subsidies, and aid uh, has been a constant feature of the uh, state, affecting both the characteristics and the structure of the state. What happened after 9-11, it was not something new, uh, and it, uh, the flow of aid to Afghanistan reinforced the building of what I call it an aid-based rentier state. Then what happened after 9-11, foreign aid had paradoxical impact. On the one hand, aid significantly uh, contributed to economic growth, uh, expansion of public services such as health and access to education. But on the other hand, um, the form of aid dependency that Afghanistan endure, endured and um, reliance on off-budget aid uh, had negative implications for accountability and the state building. Especially the paradoxes can be observed through four mechanisms. Uh, the first one is an upward accountability to donors. The second one, the creation of a parallel public sector. Uh, the third one, paradoxical tax outcomes. And the fourth one, divergence in state society fiscal relationship. Before discussing some of these paradoxes, I would like to um, share with you some facts about, uh, uh, about aid uh, and a foreign aid in Afghanistan. First, when Afghanistan needed the most, uh, it received the least aid, especially in the two years after intervention or conflict, Afghanistan received less aid per capita in comparison to other countries in similar situations, such as Bosnia and uh, uh, Timur, uh, five to 10 times less uh, in comparison to those countries. <laughs> Same coming uh, uh, to uh, military aid, uh, there was a, a, a gap being left and little investment took place to build a local capacity or the capacity of security institutions or uh, having more um, peacekeeping keep, troops on the ground. Second, uh, what was promised uh, by donors, uh, those were not um, uh, implemented uh, in reality. So there was a huge gap between like uh, commitment pledge and real disbursements. And third one, uh, aid and donor uh, were fragmented in Afghanistan. We had a number of fact, uh, uh, actors uh, with diverse strategies and um, uh, also processes uh, relying on those. And the third one was uh, um, or the, the, uh, 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 in terms of uh, the, the aid coming to Afghanistan, there was outflow of aid, and we were arguing that the aid was earmarked for Afghanistan, but not to Afghanistan. I will discuss about that. Coming to the first paradox, uh, upward accountability uh, to, to donors. As for aid and uh, donors were fragmented, and there was multiple conditions or in, and also um, processes and mechanisms such as um, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, implementation, and, uh, and also uh, evaluation processes, and uh, it fragmented the, the, the entire process. And within that uh, context, donors were micromanagement uh, uh, the aid in Afghanistan. So what happened as a result of that, it made the government increasingly accountable uh, to and preoccupied with donors. So what was the impact of that? It uh, encouraged or, uh, let or undermined 
um, the process of addressing some of the pressing uh, domestic challenges uh, in the country. Coming to the second one, or the second paradox, uh, creation of a parallel public sector. In late 2001 and uh, then 2002 and after that, the international community found that the state was extremely weak and fragmented. And also there was an urgent need of uh, delivering services. So what happened? Uh, donors bypassed the, the uh, government and the state institutions. As a result of that, because it was huge, it created a f form of public, parallel public sector which was fiscally much bigger than the state permanent institutions. I gave you the, the figure. Between 2002 and 2010, um, out of $56 billion, which was dispersed, uh, more than 82% bypassed the state. So that parallel public sector was fiscally much bigger. And also, somehow this parallel public sector uh, helped to improve service delivery. But the challenge with that process was in, it increased the cost of service delivery because of uh, um, multi-level uh, multi uh, contractual uh, arrangement. Most of the projects were subcontracted at, uh, at different levels. And also because donors were concerned to reduce corruption, there was problem of corruption with the public sector, but also this parallel public sector became a, a, a major source of corruption. Another challenge with this uh, mechanism was that this uh, sector, the parallel public sector, through that, uh, the employees would uh, uh, or could get a higher salaries or could offer like uh, higher salaries in comparison to the permanent public institutions. At the beginning of last decade, uh, on average, the salary uh, of a government employee was fifty dollars per month. But through this mechanism, one would could receive uh, ten to twenty times higher than that amounts of uh, money. And also somehow it encouraged the potential uh, skilled employees uh, to, uh, to join this parallel public sector because of the incentives. So what happened then, it uh, diverted much of political and financial resources to reform the state and build the capacity of the state. Another uh, problem with this uh, approach was because most of the money through this mechanism uh, came through off budget. I studied by, by the World Bank found that each dollar through off budget mechanism which bypassed the state had 10 to 25 percent impact on domestic economy, meaning using uh, domestic products and services, while in the case of on budget, um, it was between 70 to 95 uh, percent. As a result, this mechanism prolonged the uh, state weakness because the problem was not with this uh, process at all, but it was huge and also used as a permanent mechanism, while it should have been uh, small and used as a transitional mechanism. Coming to, to the next, uh, next one, paradoxical tax outcomes. Um, partial reform of the taxation system um, uh, somehow um, uh, did not improve much the effectiveness of the tax administration in Afghanistan. And there was also or, or, uh, over-reliance concentration of donors and the government on revenue generating targets neglecting the politics of taxation and the need for, for the emergence of a social fiscal contract uh, around taxation between the state and citizens. There was also another issue with that, the exemption of aid, uh, uh, both military and development aid from tax prevented the emergence of a harmonized taxation uh, in Afghanistan. So there was um, low compliance and also um, high tax evasion. Coming to the fourth one, uh, the most important one, uh, uh, a state society relationship, or what I call it fiscal relationship. 
as the government and societal actors such as NGOs and uh, civil society organizations were preoccupied uh, or uh, with, uh, with donors and negotiating, bargaining on uh, funding projects or um, aid, uh, that uh, led to, uh, in, some, in some cases, exacerbated the existing gap between the state and society because neither the government had to uh, um, uh, work with the societal actors and, not, and neither the, uh, on the other hand, societal actors did not need to uh, get the approval of government for, for, for the funding. Um, so there is another question, why this happened? Uh, well, Afghanistan made uh, uh, significant progress uh, since uh, late 2002 and two, uh, late 2001 and 2002, uh, but also um, uh, uh, it fell to, uh, to, to, to meet the expectations, especially three factors contributed or undermined the process. Uh, the first one uh, uh, I found uh, was an institutional legacy. At the beginning of the last decade, Afghanistan inherited weak and new patrimonial institutions, fragmented, and uh, making the process of state building uh, much more difficult. The second factor uh, is uh, elite fragmentation in the politics of uh, patronage. Um, and uh, it had immediate impact on the initial design of state institutions because senior positions were offered in exchange for political support. While one would argue that, okay, short-term stability was necessary, but in the long term, this process undermined both um, stability and long-term uh, state building. The third one, which is uh, related to the uh, role of international community and uh, the form of aid that Afghanistan received, uh, or uh, one aid modality, uh, which I mentioned, over-reliance on off-budget funding, lack of balance between short-term and long-term objectives, and also the subordination of um, state building to war on terror. So that was another... Uh, paradox. The last factor um, which I didn't discuss about, and that's very important, not only in the case of Afghanistan, and, but also many other fragile situations, the role of external uh, factors or external sources of fragility. And in the case of Afghanistan, the insurgency of the Taliban and other groups uh, militants, which had safe havens and critical support from outside Afghanistan, also undermined the process of state building. Coming to uh, to the conclusion, what uh, what I argue in this book is that foreign aid helped to build and undermine the state in Afghanistan, and uh, that while. Uh, I argue in the book that the relationship between foreign aid and the state building is highly complex, but by and large, a number of factors can determine the outcome, and those are um, uh, donors' intention and interest, aid modalities, uh, institutional legacy of the recipient, as well as policy options. What, what, what was cr uh, critical, um, in the process, what this book uh, recommends that this process is complex, but we need a, a rethink of, of uh, international policy uh, towards uh, situations of fragility and policy options to in order to make the state building process more and aid more effective. I stop here. Thank you. Stay, stay, do stay there. So, ladies and gentlemen, as suggested, I um, want to create an opportunity. Uh, Namat has very succinctly summarised his argument. But if any of you had questions of a factual nature or there's anything you wanted to ask to deepen your understanding of the situation, um, please do ask those questions now. Please save your comments and, and provocations, uh, your opinions, for a little bit later on once we've heard from our other discussants. But if anyone's got questions of clarification on the figures that Namat shared or anything else about the situation that you wanted to ask about, then please do ask us now.
Yeah, thank you, Dr. Matula, uh, for that presentation. I just wanted to ask, you, like, uh, what was the, you mentioned that uh, there was lack of capacity in the government, and that's why a lot of the aid bypassed the government. But what were the one of the more key factors to why so much aid bypassed the government, except the, the lack of capacity within the governmental institutions? Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, a number, of, uh, not only capacity, but also this uh, donors' policies, because uh, most of the donors with uh, pro-market policies, they prefer to work uh, uh, directly with uh, non-state actors. Uh, so it was capacity, uh, the question of capacity, and also corruption. And uh, in some cases, also in particular in the case of USAID, it's uh, unlikely that the con Congress allow uh, USAID to be managed by, uh, by a recipient government. So a number of factors. But in particular, in the case of Afghanistan, the major argument was capacity and uh, waste. Any other questions of clarification? Any other facts or queries? Okay, in that case, thank you so much, Namad. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my, my pleasure to introduce our, our second speaker this evening. Um, Mr. Javed Lubin is uh, currently the Deputy Foreign Minister of Political Affairs in Afghanistan. He was the ambassador to Canada uh, for Afghanistan from 2009 to 2012 and to Norway prior to that, and previously served as Chief of Staff and Director of Communications uh, for President Karzai. So in this debate around uh, state capacity, um, we could not be more fortunate to have uh, somebody who's seen a lot of that working, I know, with Namat in that capacity to share a little bit with us his experience, but also I hope to give an insight as to whether or not you agree with your friend. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miller. I really, truly appreciate uh, the invitation uh, to, to be here today. Um, very much uh, impressed by, by this institution that you've got, um, um, truly. Um, I um, just have a very small point of clarification. I'm, I'm, I'm not currently uh, the deputy foreign minister or associated with the government in any way. But that's a good thing because that means I can speak freely. Uh, so, so no loss there. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, but for the part that I was involved with the, with the Afghan government and there was, a, there was a, this rather sort of brief uh, time when I did have, well thank you so much. I, I'm so much not used to using these things uh, when I talk, but, but frankly, you know, you guys in Oxford, don't, they just take it for granted. But we, uh, when we, we are invited to speak in Oxford, we, uh, we feel so intimidated. <laughs> uh, so for the first time, I just thought I'll, I'll have to just, you know, write something and, and, um, and, and make sure I, I, I appear uh, uh, a little serious. Um, <laughs> But I, I, um, no, it, it's, a, it's genuinely an honor uh, to, to be here, and, um, and, and uh, I, for the, I was just going to say that for the little, uh, rather brief time that my work in the government overlapped with uh, Dr. Sebejan's work, uh, I, I, always, uh, I always thought we had, uh, we had in him uh, the, the potential to... Uh, to, to really, uh, I think, rise above the, uh, what really uh, working in the government uh, comes down to, which is really the, the, a, a machinery that can easily lose the ability to think, um, to reflect. And so I think it's, um, uh, but then it's, it's, it's also a very enticing machinery. So because the day-to-day, -day, the pressure of day-to-day -day keeps you going and, and, and you think that's what, uh, uh, that's what you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to, where you're supposed to be. Uh, so I think that it was probably his decision and people such as him that inspired me to to take a decision at some point in my own political career to then decide to leave 
the government and go on and do something else. And I think he made the, the, the much better decision to come to academia and, and study, uh, whereas I, I, I went in another direction. I went to the private sector, uh, and that's why I feel intimidated today. So I, uh, but I hope I have got uh, some, uh, what uh, I think I have useful today to share with you is maybe some broad observations. Uh, because I feel uh, terribly out of depth when it comes to the academic discussion. Um, so um, it's really uh, uh, the first observation I would make is about, um, uh, I think, that the, the very sort of broad principle that Dr. Asad Neymat uh, takes in his book, and that is the relationship between, uh, uh, between aid and state building. Uh, and I think... Uh, for me, the interesting thing is uh, when I was studying at some time, very, very long time ago, and before I went to government and lost that or, or useful uh, thing, uh, connections, uh, I, it was a time when states were eroding. Um, it was a time in, in the early 90s and sort of in the post-Cold War era when, uh, when, when we, we thought we were in a, in a post-state uh, era when... Um, uh, when, when we didn't really see them anymore as a very uh, essential uh, 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 or, or even useful constituents of uh, sort of social and political order in the society. Uh, uh, we saw them as an add-on. Uh, 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 but, then, but then it has come back. I think in the early, what we have seen since the turn of the millennium is we've seen such a return of the state. Um, whether you talk about a place like Afghanistan, uh, sort of a, a society affected by, by conflict and, and chaos, or, or even in the West here. Now, I think we have seen uh, a, a return of, uh, of, of the state. So, um, uh, so, so I think that's, uh, that's the one uh, 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 crucial uh, uh, thing, and we have... Uh, and, and the whole question of why should we be uh, concerned about uh, what the effect of um, the aid that is, uh, that is uh, provided uh, from one part of the world to another part of the world where it's needed, uh, what impact that would have on the state, that's, for me, it's a very interesting one. But for me, it's, I think it also goes back to, to, uh, to one of the fundamental problems that exists. And that problem is, um, is, uh, is, is the lack of, uh, um, uh, I think, lack of consensus about, um, about uh, the uh, objective or the goal of, of uh, interventions, aid intervention, whether it's humanitarian intervention or whether it's, you know, speaking from my own experience uh, in Afghanistan, it's... Uh, uh, you know, you can't really call uh, uh, that uh, uh, truly a uni humanitarian intervention. Uh, it's more like a security-driven uh, uh, um, um, geopolitically uh, inspired, uh, but also humanitarian at the same time uh, intervention. So. Um, Um, the uh, uh, and, and, and part of the problem, I think, in the uh, uh, in this uh, uh, notion of a focus on the state that I see, uh, and I saw this from my own experience, was that the way uh, uh, the aid architecture sees uh, state is a very narrow, functional view of state, uh, and with. Tremendous respect to Dr. Azerbaijan, the, the seeing the state just as a as a machinery to levy taxes and deliver public services is uh, uh, is I think only one aspect, one dimension. And especially when you talk when you're talking about uh, uh, societies that are uh, in the process of transformation, like Afghanistan, there is a much much larger, much much bigger. A dimension to, to uh, the role of the state, and that's the political dimension, uh, 
which is often disregarded or, in worst case scenario, actively undermined by, um, by the aid uh, system. Um, and, and we saw this in Afghanistan as well, that, the, that um, the, this clash between, and Dr. Sajjus and his uh, remarks refer to it, uh, the tension that we see a lot of times between the two dimensions of state. Uh, primarily, I would say, in a, you know, if you asked uh, uh, you know, an Afghan about how they view and, uh, the, the most significant uh, sort of manifestation of the, the, the recreation of the Afghan state after the Taliban uh, 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 collapse in 2001, I think uh, they would put the, uh, uh, you know, this whole sort of functional view of the state uh, as a secondary. Prim the primary uh, concern for, for the Afghan would be the fact that uh, the state is uh, both the end in the means um, of achieving a sort of a level of political coherence, political unification of some sort uh, uh, for the society to come together after a, a very uh, uh, fragmenting uh, experience and then to then uh, create uh, a, a, you know, a, new, a new future for itself. So I think that's what uh, the my, my, my most important sort of observation to, uh, that I wanted to make today was the um, was really this seeing the two uh, different dimensions of the of of the role of the state in, in societies like Afghanistan, post-conflict uh, societies like Afghanistan. Uh, the other observation I wanted to make was about some. Uh, I mean, it's from my my own experience. Uh, of uh, being involved with the Afghan government in very, um, I would say, uh, extensive sort of uh, in, in interactions I have had over the years with the rest of the world. Afghanistan at one point was this unique case where a, a very small, very extremely impoverished uh, 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 country, I wouldn't even call a state because effectively the state um, had to be remade uh, from scratch um, was was now interacting with uh, with with the massive influx of 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 uh, of the, an, uh, elements of the of an of a global truly global intervention uh, and um, so I saw uh, both the positive sides of this and, and also the negative sides of this I think on the in terms of some sort of critical observations about this. I think one of the one of the uh, uh, the, the, the most important things that I uh, uh, saw in terms of the American-led intervention in Afghanistan in post-Taliban period was the fact that there was no uh, there was a there was a consensus behind uh, the fact that America was now in, involved and there was a, something called the war uh, against terrorism and and they all wanted to, uh, they all, everybody, in fact, with perhaps the single exception of Pakistan, uh, our, our big uh, kindly neighbor um, to the east, uh, everybody across the board uh, agreed on the fact that it was justified, it was legitimate to, um, to intervene in Afghanistan. However, if you asked me if there were two countries that really, truly, deeply saw eye to eye in terms of the objective, in terms of why we were there, or why everyone was there, I can't name them. Perhaps the UK and the US were the, the two closest allies because they agreed on practically everything together, but even that uh, didn't always happen. Uh, uh, Mr. Miller is here, and with his background in the UK government would, would, would have his views about this, but I didn't really, I think this, and this was a major weakness because really this, uh, um, there was no sort of, uh, 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 you know, agreement, no consensus behind, behind the objective of the, of the intervention. 
in America itself was everybody thought they were there because um, for their own reasons, obviously, but also because they wanted to be there when the U.S. was involved. But the U.S. itself was deeply divided, um, and I think that's a, 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 that sort of brings me to the to, to my second second point about the um, uh, some of the inherent. Uh, challenges or, or, or flaws in the intervention or the aid architecture, if you like, um, and that is the uh, uh, is the fact that I, I think the way that um, interventions are, and I'm, I'm using the word intervention, I think, as probably in, in a slightly different way than the, the aid architecture, because for for me, as I said uh, earlier. It's not just about, uh, it never works in, in isolation to the political and military or security that dimension. Uh, aid is always provided in a, in a space that's characterized by those you know, imperatives, whether it's political or, or military. So, so I think the, um, you know, that's why I think intervention is probably a, a more appropriate word um, for, uh, in terms of the uh, post-Taliban period in Afghanistan. I think the world was completely um, ill-prepared for something like that at the time. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the way I, uh, in my interactions with the, uh, with, for example, with the American government, um, I, was, um, I, was, I was utterly surprised by how uh, uncoordinated they were. Uh, this whole thing, sometimes I thought this whole thing was like a tyranny of bureaucracy. Uh, it was, uh, there was this very, very big important political goal that uh, was often driven from right from the top, from the president himself. However, the, the, the bureaucracy, uh, by the time it, it actually, the consequences of those political decisions reached the ground to translate into some sort of action on, uh, in Afghanistan, um, all these bureaucracies would really uh, uh, kill it, uh, would, would really uh, go in different directions. Uh, so I think it was, um, uh, that uh, was the other thing that, uh, that, that I, I think in terms of the approach uh, of the intervention, the different uh, functions that these bureaucracies in the West here serve in over the years, in, not years, over the centuries have served the interest of the countries themselves, whether you're talking about here in the UK or whether you talk about the American system, the constitution of, of the United States is probably the most um, perfect uh, uh, work of, of, of political science that's ever been created. But when it comes to uh, new things like the intervention in a country 10,000 kilometers away, it didn't really have any prescription. And that's why I think um, you know, one of the things I would really uh, very, very strongly point out, and, and, and of, of all places, I think in a place like this one, would be the importance of learning lessons. Uh, and I know we are we generally, I think, terrible when it comes to, uh, uh, first of all, learning lessons, then reapplying them. We, we tend to reinvent the wheel every time, so, so often. Um, uh, so, so that's why I think um, uh, I would hate to, as an Afghan, I would really hate to see yet another intervention uh, where we make exactly the same mistakes like we did. Um, the, 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 the other, and I know I'm, 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 I'm probably overstaying my, my, my welcome here in terms of the time I'm taking, but, but very, very quick few other points. The importance of cultural differences is very key as well. I mean, I, 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 I truly think I, uh, you know, I am, uh, I'm, a, I'm a diehard liberal uh, when it comes to, uh, to the discussion of, uh, of, of, of cult culture, uh, and I really truly believe in, in humanism and universal uh, values. Um, but, but I think um, culture plays a role in much more practical ways than you think. A lot of times when you talk about culture, then immediately people think, oh, there is a clash of values, or these Afghans are different, and these Americans are different, or the Western. That's not uh, at all what I'm referring to when I talk about ca culture. Culture, I, uh, I think, in terms of very much practical, in terms of the communication between the two sides, is key. I, th I think uh, it was very interesting that when, um, uh, you know, between President Karzai, uh, who 
my former boss, uh, and 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 most of you would would know that one of the, the, the I think perhaps the biggest I would say reason for some of the failures that um, uh, that we've had is the fact that there wasn't a very uh, a, a very uh, meaningful. Uh, a constructive relationship between uh, between the, the, the sort of the inter international community led by the U.S. Um, and the Afghan partner, the, uh, because at the end of the day, when uh, what we were doing there, or what what was being done, was to create uh, to to create a, a, a state, uh, and it was very essential to have a local partner that's credible and that's uh, capable. Um, I would say the, the most important reason for that failure was failure of communication. It was not failure of uh, clashing values. It was not a failure of uh, clashing strategies. Um, it, it was really simply a question of understanding each other. Uh, and uh, going back, I think the responsibility is, is both ways because uh, on the one hand, probably Karzai was a very tribal man and had his own uh, agenda. Uh, but the U.S. was also very bureaucratic. I think that the language that the State Department spoke was completely different and, and at times very misleading compared to the language that the Department of Defense was speaking, for example, or when the Treasury that Dr. Seb Neymar has the experience of probably completely spoke a, 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 an entirely different language. Um, but I would say, um, uh, you know, all these... Uh, with, with, with all these criticisms that you can have, uh, and I must point out that a lot of the criticisms are to do with, uh, and then maybe because of my own experience is, is only limited, was to do with the political dimension of intervention. I think on the, on the security and on the economic side, uh, there are problems, there were failures. I think the, 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 uh, one of the, the absolutely uh, uh, biggest uh, uh, um, a, a challenge was the whole sort of parallel structures uh, uh, issue that uh, that continues to be the, uh, a, a major uh, a major challenge. Uh, in in on on the other side, but but really one um, uh, other than than that, uh, I, I see uh, as an Afghan, I think the. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, achievements as well, which, uh, which m must not be forgotten. I think a country like Afghanistan, whether this was driven by, uh, by a, 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 an imperative, a security imperative that had nothing to do with Afghans or Afghanistan, or whether it was uh, uh, driven or whether or not it was driven by purely humanitarian concerns, whatever the, the, the cause was, the outcome is that today, Afghanistan is a completely different society than it was 15 years ago. Uh, for one thing, since I've gone to the private sector, I'm, I'm utterly amazed by how many millionaires we have now, whereas 15 years ago, we prob I could probably count uh, the uh, uh, number of Afghan millionaires fewer fingers than, than you, I, can, I have in one hand. Um, but right now, it's, it's absolutely Dubai, is bustling with, with, with Afghan uh, money. And the challenge really is, part of the challenge, I think, is that it would be, it would be so much uh, more uh, wiser, I would say, uh, meaningful if Afghans in the international community as well, they did something to attract some of that money back into Afghanistan in terms of investment in, in, in those things. But with, with that, I think I've, um, well, once again, it's been, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. And, and I must say, um, Dr. Seb Neymar, just a last word about you. you I'm, I'm truly proud of you. I think what you've done is uh, really focus on an extremely important question we have had, uh, uh, we've had to face in the last 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and, and I hope, uh, going back to my, uh, my point about learning lessons, if, uh, you know, if we could maybe make this as a, as a basically uh, as, as a start to study Afghanistan carefully for what it presents. Uh, I think a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of lives have actually gone into this uh, intervention now. 
So, so having like some sort of a, a, an Afghanistan studies thing where you take lessons and see all these mistakes that have been made and, and not uh, out of uh, ill um, intention. Uh, I don't think anybody is claiming that, but it's purely um, driven by the fact that we didn't have experience of doing this, uh, this ever. But, but hopefully we will not have, thanks to, to the work that you have done, Dr. Uh, Martin, other work, we could maybe reapply this in other contexts in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Luden. So our last speaker this evening is Professor Stefan Durkin. Uh, Stefan is the Professor of Economic Policy here at the Blavatnik School, jointly with the Department of Economics in Oxford. Um, and he was also, from 2011 to 2017, the Chief Economist at uh, the Department for International Development in the UK. So just as Mr. Luden made clear that he is no longer in the government and therefore speaking for them, equally Stefan's period of office at DFID uh, neatly followed the period which uh, Namat studied. So he doesn't need to take full accountability for the things that were written about in the book. Nevertheless, I'm sure Stefan's going to share with us some perspective on the aid architecture and the, the questions that are raised by the book. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Colin. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And um, now it's a great pleasure to be able to, uh, to talk here. And, you know, I think it's customary to declare some interests uh, when, when one uh, talks about these things. Um, Callum definitely mentioned one that, um, you know, Fortunately, there was no overlap with the period there, but I definitely uh, have to declare some interest. You know, I did, um, um, I was fortunate to be able to travel to Afghanistan as DFID, as uh, chief economist, and get involved in some of the aftermath of that kind of period and some of the more recent discussions. Um, I, you know, at the time, definitely representing the UK, and I probably should still a little bit careful since I'm only a month out. Um, uh, how I, how I portrayed them. But anyway, even when I was inside uh, working government, it never stopped me to say all kinds of things. So I can do this definitely openly. The other interest I want to declare is that just, you know, having been lucky to travel and to be able to be there and actually seeing a bit of how the age structure was working, um, I can't deny that my interest has been spiked <laughs> enormously. And it's uh, something still, as for me, lots of unfinished business. So I'm very grateful that I was given the chance to say a few things. Um, following on to, to the book, and, I, and you know, you put a bit like the, um, the, you know, throw down the chalice, so to speak, for, um, 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 for the kind of the whole idea here of, the, of, of, of you know, what donors were doing there and, and, and questioning, in fact, the kind of uh, the, the challenge is there for us to, uh, to think carefully about, you know, what have we been doing there and indeed are we learning lessons? And I want to comment a little bit on it. Of course, we shouldn't forget that in the early days, and it was very clearly pointed out how the UK was totally aligned with the US, it was George uh, W. Bush that said, you know, we were only after justice, after revenge essentially we're not after state building you know the basic premise of you know in the early stages that was not the interest and just the way the eight agencies ended up engaging was very much always uh, walking behind what the military was doing and maybe as seen from inside an eight agency at times cleaning up the mess a little bit or at least putting all kinds of expectations on them and I will want to come to that at the very end looking forwards in terms of our relearning lessons but you know um, it is also at the same time in this entire period that you study, you know, we shouldn't underestimate that there has been, despite all these troubles and the way the state was maybe developed, but all kinds of things were achieved as well. And, you know, in development, we do like to quote our figures of, of, of progress. I'm not saying it's because of aid, but in this case, because aid was the main source of financing of the state, whether it was on or off budget, uh, you know, you got... Yeah, from 1 million to 9.2 million people, uh, sorry, children into school, a third of them girls, life expectancy going to 64 years of age, and infant mortality halving. You know, actually still quite remarkable that sometimes gets forgotten is doing it. Now, but I don't want to stand here and say, oh, I want to defend the way it is done. Because you're in your analysis in your book, I mean, there's, there is actually nothing that I disagree with, and I want to actually just push it a bit further into some of the, some of the lessons. Um, it was clear that, you know, when it was maybe needed in the early days, it wasn't there. And by the end of the period, it was quite big. And it's quite, quite striking that, um, you know, but we, that we shouldn't also underestimate 
what we then actually got to the kind of aid levels that we got. You know, at the end of your period, like 2010-11, um, all figures are a little bit different, I know, because it's the way sometimes statistics is, but if you go to some of the OECD figures, we got to something like 15.7 billion aid uh, coming to Afghanistan. That's 98% of GDP. You know, that is the highest in the world. That is a kind of an, uh, a figure that, you know, usually we would say once it goes over 20%, you're going wrong. And, and it is some kind of the levels that, that we start to achieving. A third of that, of course, this was not all old in the way that we would like to consider, kind of call it in the UK, different budgets, development system, but it was still, you know, 5.4 billion of ODA that would be categorized as overseas development assistance, which is again higher than any country in the world as a share. Now, of course, you're absolutely correct. It's not so much about the amounts that were spent, but I think the amounts uh, are also, of course, correlated with the way these things got, got spent. You emphasized, you know, the 56 billion in this period, um, in the period, in the kind of a 10-year period. Of course, the larger share was the U.S. Yeah, it's U.S. is, of course, the one donor that doesn't want to spend on government systems. You know, it's even surprising that even in the figures you have that so much was spent on government systems from the U.S. Because it's something fundamentally in the aid system in the U.S. Congress hates spending via governments because governments don't, they're, they're not, you know, they're not the right instruments to do it. It should be in parallel. It should be NGOs or something like that. That's everywhere in the world. If the U.S. is the leading donor, you have a huge amount of budget, which is really troubling, of course. It's um, still reasonably okay. I'm not trying to defend it here. I'm definitely not put here this time to, to defend UK. But, you know, I think it was the third or fourth biggest donor in this period. Um, you know, after Japan, the European Union. But the European Union and, and, and the UK were about 35 to 40% on budget. Now, that becomes a more reasonable figure. That's actually put, trying to put a bigger part. And then I'm not even sure how you're counting RETF because that's partly of budget or on budget. I'm not even sure how the statistic dealing with, but basically a lot of the spending on social sector spending was always organized in pseudo, pseudo on budget, you know, using not quite the systems there. So an awful lot of the social sector spending was there as well. So all I want to actually say is that, yes, there was a lot of, of it of budget, but the sums are also massive. I actually think some of the bigger problems were is that the total sum at times was so big. And that a bit, the size of the budget also made the state building really very hard. Or put it slightly differently, that it even let all kinds of organizations to actually say, well, we don't mind, you know, and I had it when I visited. I, it's not that, this, that these uh, second civil service, the part of the state that's of budget, budget, is suddenly operating from little offices in other parts of Kabul. They are sitting in the office. In fact, virtually all the interlocutors I had in the Treasury and the Ministry of Finance were of budget. So it is all part of the whole thing. It's a kind of a, and it's something that I definitely don't want to defend, but it is also under, uh, something to do with the way it was happening. Of course, the security spending similarly, and the second civil service, it had definitely to do with the sums increasing, the donors desperately obsessed with trying to achieve results. Because military action is happening, the donor agencies, the aid agencies, having to follow with all kinds of hearts and minds that we know from the evidence doesn't work, um, and that actually being pushed and delivered in all kinds of way, by, um, um, you know, including via second civil service and the whole thing. And essentially, and then we are in agreement, building up a state that isn't a state that could ever be sustainable if you want to go to another regime that is away from this thing. And so, there's, so the whole pressure of spending vast amounts of money, I know it in the UK, while British soldiers were dying, Diffit, please step up and spend a lot of money, I'm not sure whether you remember these times, but that was definitely the sense we had all the time. You better step up because there's British involvement there. We don't know how to spend it, and yes, it's hard to actually find a way of doing it. So push it in all kinds of things as if there is, yes, literally as if there's no yesterday, nor there is any tomorrow. It's about results now. Very quick and all thing, and very ill-conceived. So, so we have that. Now, that's one thing. I think. The incentives that this gives for state building were very limited. I actually think I want to get a step further. The size of these amounts that were being spent 
in a context where absorption was extremely hard. And whether it was true or not, and we could argue about it, was there maybe more absorptions on budget? But in the end, the total sums, you know, if you come to 98% of your GDP, that is far more than your country could ever absorb in any reasonable way in terms of incentives. Created massive incentives to distort the economy, where you got essentially incredible incentives to build up um, you know, a private sector that absorbs the aid. Non-tradable, typically, security-related, construction-related, basically anything that can absorb aid. Massive distortion, non-tradable goods, the purest Dutch disease that you can have. The purest kind of incentives that you actually move everything away. And I, I, I don't want to make, I, I, it will sound as if I'm commenting on you and I don't want to do it there. But of course, an awful lot of these firms that were getting these contracts were Dubai-based. And I, the correlation with the millionaires, I don't want to go into, let other people think about. But that's indeed the kind of things that we then start seeing. So not only didn't we have any incentive for state building with this whole thing, we had no incentives for economy building. Now, and then I want to come to some of the things. You know, what does it mean next? And that was a bit in the period that I was a bit involved in DFID. Now you start looking at it and say, what do you have now? You know, I was there in the build-up of the, I think it was the Brussels conference um, on Afghanistan, where everybody said we need massive amounts of money. And actually, fundamentally, we need these incredible amounts of money because the costs of running the state by this kind of the, the, the whole Dutch disease incentives have to, you know, are now so large that actually no donor anymore can afford it. In fact, we've made the, the, the size, the, the amounts of aid that came on the back of the military and the military as well, that is part of the distortion of the security and the construction sector. We made basically the state budget, even if we were to put it on the state or off budget, but we made the state essentially unaffordable. And it's one of these things, the future state, I think, is totally in the fall, but in the period you're talking about, in dollars, the budget in Afghanistan is, has increased tenfold in dollars. Now, that's something that costs more aid money and has to come more into it and so on. So I do remember the, the pressures that before the Brussels conferences, we need to find half a billion easily. You know, we need to find, that was on the UK side, can we find half a billion? I don't think we can. Um, and everywhere we need to scramble for money because we have to keep on this system. Because, you know, the problem is, this is building it up as if there's no tomorrow, but we still need to keep that, that, that state going. This was gambling on quick success, both on hearts and minds, and success of peace. And in the end, it's a much more protected conflict. And it's actually not clear whether the money is for tomorrow. So my worry is not so much even that we threw away the chance of state building maybe in the early periods, but actually then the way we responded during the conflict is actually we make peace virtually unaffordable. Um, and that's the kind of stuff. The fiscal burden side, you know, we can dream of it, but there is no rate of GDP that can ever replace 98% of GDP. You can't tax 98% of GDP. So you can't do that. And even 35, 40% just to do the eight part in the pure social sector spending and related to it is unrealistic. And that's a really strange thing because now, come yes, and I don't want to take much more time. In terms of lessons learning, Okay, one of the issues here was is that, and we've seen this if you read Chilcot carefully on Iraq, you get exactly the same. People in Chilcot inquiry told us that one thing that they were totally convinced had been kind of working on behavioral science is that people are totally in these circles full of confirmation bias. Or put it slightly differently, they only look for the evidence that supports their, their story. The, the whole time in this kind of conflict, we build up something that, oh, well, we can now do this. We can use this money, we can do this, all these kind of things. The political idea during this conflict on the donor side is, surely the aid, the aid budget can surely help here the military and we can do hearts and minds and that whole kind of stuff. The evidence on hearts and minds uh, spending is limited. It's incredibly difficult. So there is a lot of self-illusion and so on. But then the whole process ends up, um, as I said already, a potential what is the future. So what would be? You know, suppose peace were to break out. Suppose imagine that scenario. What is that next? Okay. So one of the real tricky things is that the right response would be try to then start building the state in a sustainable way. Make a state that becomes sustainable. 
that probably means 8, but actually, strangely enough, building Gooding in 8, that makes the state cheaper so you can start affording it in due course to do it. If you start looking at these numbers, they're scary, how much the state costs now. The alternative is, is that what we probably will do um, sorry, so we can actually spend quite a lot, but it has to be really with the vision of the long run. We probably end up doing peace, briefly have an awful lot of money, and are suddenly doing exactly what happened in the early period that is said. Oh, well, it's been spent, now there's peace, now we're in control, we use all the aid. And it's a real going to be a hard, hard issue. Can, how will we try to build, have a no regret peace dividend if it comes, compared to how can we ever build an affordable, sustainable state? And is that dilemma, I have no answer to, but it's typically in fragile states. We have it as, as extreme as we ever can in Afghanistan. So I wish I would have said something more positive, except for saying this is really worthwhile because that early period is where the seeds are sown for the real difficulties we have now to actually see what could come next in the future for Afghanistan. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to move now to some questions. I'm going to ask the speakers to come and join me at the front here so that we can field your questions. So, who would like to kick us off with a, with a remark or question uh, on the discussion that we've had so far? Please. If you just very kindly just give your name and, and any affiliation you have so the speakers know where you come from, that would be great. There's a microphone just coming to you now. Thank you so much. It's a really genuine pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm also... Uh, a former govern, government worker for the Afghanistan government and a former colleague of Dr. Bejan and Mr. Lodin, but um, been away from the government for quite some time now. Um, let me begin, if I may, with an example. Uh, I was working for the government, for the Ministry of uh, Commerce at that time, when I met this guy from the U.S. Department of Defense, and he wanted to uh, spend some money which he had uh, of, the, it was the not, it's non-military aid that they had. They had to spend it, and they had limited amount of time, and they had to, to spend it on something. So they came to me because I was working for the export promotion at that time, and we were helping these uh, uh, carpet uh, producers in Afghanistan. And one of the weaknesses, the problems we had was the, uh, the capacity of cutting and washing carpets in Afghanistan. That's why they had to send their carpets to Pakistan and all those problems. So this guy wanted to spend this money in Afghanistan about like six, seven million dollars. Uh, his plan was to make a huge washing and cutting factory in Afghanistan and then everybody can use that washing and cutting factory. I told him, look, the challenge will be who will manage this? There will be a conflict of interest if you give it to one producer there will be a conflict of, a conflict of interest, and that guy will use it for himself and then others. Or if you give it to a third party and then everybody, the management will become an issue, they, the maintenance of this factory, everything. So why don't you use a different modality, split this money into six different, different millions, and then we will encourage the producers to put a million. It's like a public-private partnership. And then we will have six factories in six different places that will help. Okay, anyway, the guy took my advice, but then later on I realized that he spent the money in the way he wanted, which we saw the result. So this is one example of probably thousands, and I'm uh, totally with Mr. Lodin in that, that definitely there was some um, incapability, the institutional uh, the problems within the government of Afghanistan in terms of uh, receiving and implementing those aids. But on the other side, on the donor side, we also had a huge problem. So I don't, I don't know, it was, definitely there's not the policy from the government side that had, the, the donor side that had that problem. But when it came to implementing those money coming to Afghanistan, they, the money were coming right and left from everywhere, from the Department of Defense. From, I'm just giving an example of U.S. because that was counting for... 60, 70 percent of the total aid coming to Afghanistan at that time. Um, so you could see a huge problem there as well. I, I, I totally respect the fact that uh, we at that time on the government side, coming from a background of working for the aid coordination unit, Ministry of Finance, myself, and then Ministry of Commerce, we, we were realizing the, the uh, weaknesses, institutional weaknesses within the government. But on the other side, 
I remember like for four years or five years, uh, the government was suggesting one project to the donors to, to finance, and that was the Cobble City Roads. And that was carried over everywhere to the next year, but the, the money was not given. But then when you proposed a, a project for technical advice, you would get it right away like this, and you and the country was, was bound with, with thousands and thousands of advisors, uh, respect to those who were really with, with high knowledge and came and contributed to the country. But some of them, like Afghan, uh, foreign uh, Afghans coming from different, from Europe, from US, with low knowledge or no knowledge in some cases, and receiving high salaries. And most of the money that were coming to Afghanistan in the form of aid were taken back from Afghanistan. But when it came to mortar and brick kind of projects, there was no money. So I think we started with that kind of, a lot of money were wasted in the very beginning. Um, so I, I, I think a, a little stress on the donor side, how, how fragile the, the mechanism or the implementation of those aid coming to Afghanistan was on the donor side was, uh, to me, it's a very, very important and serious factor. Thank you very much indeed. Other comments? I'll go around a little bit. I come to the gentleman asked the question earlier. There's another microphone just behind you there. It's more a question than a comment. It's if you could just introduce yourself, that would be great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. My name is Pamir Esas. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and I started political economy. But I have a more spe a specific question to Professor Durkan because I'm a dual citizen also from Norway and there was a huge report that reviewed the, their aid investment in Afghanistan that had a lot of the conclusions that, that uh, Dr. Bezin mentioned. And I just wanted to ask that when, when all of these funds were going into Afghanistan in order to much, match military or political objectives, how come, or did this happen, I don't know, how come no one from the international community warned the consequences of letting so much cash go in and absorb in other state sectors and undermine the government? And specifically in your incident, did you warn, for instance, the, the Minister of Aid and Development about adding another 500 million just like that, just because of uh, casualties that the British military had? Take one more question, and then we'll come to the panel. The lady in the centre there, if you can the mic there. Hi, my name is Alexis, um, and I'm an MPhil student here, looking at Iranian and American engagement in Afghanistan. Um, thank you all for speaking with us tonight. Um, but my specific question is for uh, Mr. Ludin. I um, you, you mentioned that. You know, there was really no consensus behind the objectives of the U.S.-led intervention. I, um, I'm just wondering if you thought that that was always the case, even initially at the December 2001 Bonn conference, um, where just based on sort of personal interviews I've done, albeit only with the U.S. participants, um, but I've learned that there was pretty significant cooperation between the Iranian and American delegations there, and sort of how they worked together to lobby the, the various Afghan groups. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you could speak to you know, whether or not you thought there was at least initially a consensus. Um, and also, you know, based on my own interviews, they, they spoke about the conference as like, this grand success, at least initially. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you agree with that and if you think the structure of that you know, first UN-sponsored initiative um, impacted the subsequent state-building initiatives. Thank you. Great. Um, Stefan, first question for you. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, it's, it, you, you make here a good point, and you ask about the advice I gave. So I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, I mean, you, you have to, you have to understand, I think, and given the way you're studying it as well as seen from a donor country, you know, the, the the political imperative in the donor country that the aid agencies seem to be supporting the military is massive, and the kind of that that when that increases, that needs the aid needs to increase as well, whether there is Right, it's, it's almost the more, you know, that, 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 that drives the whole, whole, whole thing. When we come to now, to this period, um, you know, in the recent period and on the Brussels conference, um, it's a really tricky question because, you know, um, it's not an issue now on saying we need to withdraw that half a billion now. You know, and even though, as you were alluding to, you know, a lot of these 
people came in, and you, you mentioned itself, so you know, people that actually didn't know much about the country, but they seem to be, have some Afghan roots or some semi-knowledge, and, and even just, uh, just total outsiders coming in and claiming knowledge, and, and lots of technical advisors everywhere. Of course, what they also did in the, in the civil service in general is have an upward pressure on everything. I'm not saying that the, the local staff would be paced the same thing. But, you know, all these things were, were being pushed up. You know, just withdrawing that money, it's not so obvious what you're actually going to cut. And simply saying as an advice, as a sensible advice today, say, no, no, why don't we actually don't give more aid to Afghanistan now? I'm not sure that's the right advice either. The persistence is there. The, the real question was, and I definitely, and I could actually even, no, I probably can't. I can share all my notes that I that I'd written, although, you know, and I definitely argued, you know, you know, if we're not going to look how we build a sustainable state, fiscally and, and in a sensible way, you know, we, we, we're actually not doing Afghanistan a service. So to be very careful to actually make this sustainable, which means bringing much more local people into it, getting fewer of these second civil service pseudo experts out, um, moving. And, but, you know, you get other things as well. You know, the, I was called the um, NSF, I think, or, yeah, the, 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 the security, uh, it's ENSF? Yeah, ENSDF. Yeah, yeah, ENSDF. Yeah, 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 you know, salaries are enormous. You know, if you compare it with any neighboring countries, the salaries are very enormous. Are you going to say, oh, so let's cut their wages suddenly of the military? I mean, it's not, that's not sensible advice either. But you do need, and I definitely gave that advice, you know, we need to build this down. You know, one, one thing I've learned in, in, uh, in, in working in government and advising ministers, uh, I'm sure you were an exception, but uh, long run doesn't exist, you know. Your, your cycle is about a year, about two years. So, you know, being able to actually say how is your longer term plan of engagement and having with your international partners a real conversation about it is very hard. So that's, I don't, I'm not saying that I won that battle. <laughs> Mr. Luden, do you want to comment on this? Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because I don't want there to be a confusion about what I said. I, what I said was that there was a massive uh, consensus across the world, with exception of Pakistan, mm -hmm. um, in terms of being uh, the, the legitimacy of the engagement and being involved in Afghanistan. However, there was no consensus about what we were really going to, to achieve there. So I think there was lack of clarity about the objective. And uh, on, on that one, um, part of the difficulty was really um, uh, uh, about the complexity of the, the, the political environment. A lot of the people from the West, for example, got in, involved essentially out of solidarity with the United States. Um, later on, they developed their own, uh, their, their own specific um, reasons for, for their engagement in Afghanistan. But other countries, um, by and large, um, uh, specifically those from the region, they got involved out of their own, uh, their, their own interests. And, and, and a lot of those interests weren't necessarily you know, consistent uh, with what um, the goal of, for example, the United States or, or Europe or the UK or others was. And that's why even until, very, until to this day, there hasn't been really a, 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 an across-the-board consensus about the goal um, in Afghanistan. Yeah. Did you want to go on this? Um, yeah, excellent points and issues were raised. Um, so in this book, uh, uh, what I have been trying to, to focus was uh, state capacity, the capabilities to protect citizens, deliver services, and that Afghanistan could stand on, on its own feet, be self-reliant, at least in some areas. So what, what the problem uh, was, as coming to, to the issue of, like uh, uh, mentioned by um, uh, Ludin Saib and other colleagues, that there was overarching consensus, but donors were fragmented what to do and how to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, the issue of, uh, uh, just to clarify it, when I'm talking about the parallel public sector, this we, now we have two types of civil service, primary and secondary. They're also a part of the system. I'm not concerned about those, but those uh, functions uh, operating outside the state institutions. But the challenge with those mechanisms were they were not aligned and somehow unintentionally induced competition with uh, permanent public institutions. So what happened after, let's say, 10 years, 
uh, uh, the international community or we uh, came and said, okay, now the state should do this and that, which was uh, not practical because uh, we missed the opportunity or the government missed the opportunity to learn to, from teachable mo moments by, by delivering, by engaging and being engaged in the process. And also it was somehow convenient. I'm talking in the book, it was not the international community, also for the leadership for the government in Afghanistan, some of the politicians, they, they, they had their own parallel networks running the government. So because that system was so uh, convenient and easy to deal with that. Uh, but the problem was somehow some of the problems I'm talking, it was inevitable in the case of Afghanistan because it was very challenging. But at least uh, such a mechanism could have been minimized, used as a transitional mechanism, and could have been aligned with uh, long-term objective that we had in Afghanistan. So w once the commander of NATO wrote uh, an email saying we, we should give up on the government, Afghan government, work directly with local communities, so that was an example which led to the neglect of, his, of the state to reform it and to, to improve this, the domestic checks and balances. Thank you very much. We'll take one, one last round of questions. Um, so start at the back, if we may. If we can get a microphone. Sorry, Ben, over to the back. Um, lady with her hand up and the glasses. Yeah, I'm Barbara Stapleton. I was based in Afghanistan from 2002 to 2011. In the last five and a half years, I was political advisor to the small EU political office before it merged uh, with, with uh, the political and the aid side merged eventually. Um, the only international consensus I ever witnessed in Afghanistan uh, during the period I was based there was around forging and then implementing an exit strategy from 2010 to 2014, though, of course, a political decision was taken earlier than that at levels in NATO. The question that I have is about the imposition of a free market in Afghanistan. This was a highly controversial um, uh, issue amongst Afghans who knew full well, uh, particularly qualified Afghans at the university and elsewhere, um, that the country was being flooded by cheaper, much cheaper Chinese and Turkish and other goods, and the urgent need to create jobs, which is arguably one of the most important means of stabilizing the country, um, was not only uh, uh, limited by the failure of the international community and the Afghan government in some ways as well to forge a unified economic strategy, but also by this imposition of the free market. And I wonder if you have any comments on that. Great. Thank you. Gentleman next to you, I think, had a question as well. About six years until 2011, including some time with the World Bank. Um, my question is for any of the speakers, what do you make of, of the argument that's been advanced periodically and, and again recently by Barnett Rubin that essentially there are two, I think it builds on, on your comments, Mr. Luden, about there being two dimensions of the state. The political dimension is the one that uh, is probably most important and the building of a political settlement. Um, I've always felt the New Deal which emerged during this time, which was to deal with how to give aid in fragile states, essentially amounts to telling a fragile state to act like it's not fragile. Um, in light of that, what do you make of the argument that the only way to achieve a political settlement in Afghanistan, given the historical reality that all viable states in Afghanistan have been built with foreign support requires the geopolitical and regional consensus that none of this is actually achievable without uh, a regional and international solution to the conflict. Thank you. Take two more questions. So uh, we'll come over to this side of the things. I'm sorry, those are running around with the mics. Lady here with the glasses. 
Thank you very much. Um, my name is Alexandra, and I'm an MPP student here at the Blavatnik School of Government. Uh, thank you very much for your fascinating insights. Um, I very much hope to conduct my policy research in the months to come in Afghanistan, actually, and I'm very much interested in the peace talks between Taliban um, and the um, Afghan government and also external actors um, that are powerful, such as, for instance, Pakistan. Um, and just yesterday, President Ashraf Ghani had um, sort of expressed his willingness to conduct such peace negotiations with Taliban on the basis of sort of some some agreement to respect the constitution um, and uh, to actually recognize them as, as, as political actors. Um, in the same time, I see that the new US administration has been very reluctant and focused on security rather than um, development and that somewhat delusionally believe that Taliban can be defeated by dropping bombs out of the air and I believe that that's not how insurgencies die. Um, so, um, and then following that, on the 14th of February, um, the Taliban had sent an open letter to the Americans, to the citizens of, of the United States, asking to pressure uh, the Trump administration to actually join the peace negotiations. <clears throat> so my question is, do you believe that the letter was genuine or is it some sort of political game on behalf of Taliban? And what are your um, personal perspectives on the peace negotiations of Taliban? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. The gentleman in the front here in the tie. Thank you very much. My name is Sanif. I'm from the Afghan Embassy in London. It's great to see you all. And I'm really uh, delighted to see millions of you, my former boss. <laughs> uh, Mr. Vijan, congratulations for the book. Um, I think it's uh, a pleasure to see that an, Af uh, an Afghan is now able to comment on international aid and then provide an insight to what has been achieved in Afghanistan and what we have uh, done some mistakes with regard to the spendings in Afghanistan. But my question to you um, directly is that, how do you see the balance of spending between development and security spendings in Afghanistan? Because um, uh, generally in Afghanistan, people say that development and security are the two sides of the same coin. But there were a number of surveys have been done previously by uh, some uh, institutions showing that every soldier uh, from international forces uh, costed dollars, a uh, few dollars an hour, an hour. So if you see the balance that more spending on security rather than uh, economy and development, and uh, the fact that 65% of the Afghan populations are the youth, and uh, the problem of creating jobs and also the illicit drug economy to some extent uh, affect the economy. So I'd like to see your analysis on this. Great. Um, just to explain what I'm trying to do, um, we're running slightly over, but I wanted to give all those who want to ask questions a chance to do so. So we're going to gather them all in. I'm making a note of them, and then we'll try and give the, the panel a chance to respond to those. So uh, there's a gentleman. I've got three, three last hands that I've seen I'm going to go to. So gentlemen, just behind you, if you would, um, there, and we'll just move back over this way to the last two comments. Um, yeah. Thank Obviously, you. Speakers, if you could be brief, that would be appreciated. Yes, uh, very brief. Uh, I'm Habib Meyer from the GSOM Plus Secretariat. Uh, GSOM Plus is a group of 20 conflict-affected countries, and Afghanistan is one of the leading members. So the paradox is that uh, Dr. Bejan explained is very much reflected in all these 20 countries as for our experiences. So congratulations on the very good work. Uh, I have just one quick comment and very brief question in relation to that. One of the dilemmas with Afghanistan is, from the very beginning, even since the, the, the 20th century, is that Afghanistan has never been seen from the lens from, of Afghanistan. It has always been seen from the lens of international or regional politics. For example, the recent intervention was from the lens of war on terror. The right time to intervene in Afghanistan was right after the withdrawal of the Russian troops, which was a big mistake. So now my question is particularly to uh, Stefan as representing the donor community or the, or the government of UK, um, what do you think has that narrative been changed or do you see any change in that narrative that Afghanistan should be seen from the lens of Af being a country? Uh, because it has been, it has, it's a country which has been in the longest you know, period of conflicts and crisis. And one of the reasons is that those conflicts have been imposed. They are not indigenous to the Afghan society or they are not indigenous to the environment in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentleman here in the Burgundy Jumper. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Zubair Popels. I work for the BBC Monitoring Division. Um, you touched, Dr. Nemad, on donor interest, political will vis-a-vis um, -vis state building, um, and also on state fragility. So we have established more or less that the political will did not exist, at least at the beginning. To what degree do you think the fragility problem has been addressed today? President Ghani says we will not be able to sustain ourselves 
even six months without U.S. support. Um, so do you think state building, as I understand it, building institutions of the state was a genuine exercise in doing that, building the institutions of the state, or was it a framework of meaning, a way of rationalizing policy, so to speak, um, whereby no account, nobody was accountable to anybody? So if you go to local administration, they would say, well, we cannot make a decision about this, take it to central government. You go to central government, they say, well, the World Bank would not accept it, or the U.S., or the State Department, or whatever. You go to the World Bank, they would say, well, it's, a, it's an Afghan issue, go back to the Afghan government. So nobody is re responsible or accountable for anything. So to what degree has that fragility been, been uh, addressed? Thank you. Thank you very much. And our last question from the gentleman who's been patiently waiting at the back. Thanks so much. My name is Aziz Boris. I'm an ex-diplomat uh, working and living in, here in Oxford. Uh, I want to uh, really congratulate my friend, uh, Dr. Nimet, about his book and his hard work. I have a very uh, small and direct question for all of you, especially for the Professor uh, Stephen. When the aid uh, question of the, 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 the aid of, uh, uh, things is coming in, 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 in the hand, the other hand is coming the corruption. What do you think the organized corruption like Kabul Bank, which is happening in the uh, 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 Hamid Karzai regime, which is the ex-head of the uh, central bank uh, claiming more than 500, 5 million, uh, thousand, uh, 5 million, uh, 15 million pounds is uh, corrupted by, by the Kabul Bank is increasing or decreasing the aid or the, the uh, cooperation for Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, panel, you've got a challenging task, uh, a diverse set of <laughs> questions and not a great deal of time to answer them. So what we're going to do is we're going to work our way along. You can pick uh, a number of the questions to respond to, but if you could bring your comments together, uh, that would be really appreciated. So, please. Um, Okay, well, I, I, I think there were at least a couple that I probably were you know, uh, directed at me or maybe appropriate for me to answer. Um, on the question of, um, of um, regional and international consensus for state building and the, um, and, and, and the, the whole sort of um, a challenge of, of building the Afghan state, first of all, I think there was... Um, the one uh, problem I have is uh, is with the um, um, with the whole notion of state building. Um, uh, we should have in Afghanistan had something more like a state restoration, um, because Afghanistan has had a state for for, for generations, for, for centuries. Um, well, to f uh, forget about the, the past and the, um, and the sort of imperial times, at least for the last 200 years, uh, some form of a state, even though very much influenced in dependent at times and challenged at times by external forces, but some... S um, and, and again, going back to what do we mean by state, if you take the notion of, um, of state as, as, um, as, a, as, a, as an able... Uh, tax uh, 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 levying machine uh, or a s public service provision machine, then perhaps not a big history of, of state. But if you see the state as a as a manifest manifestation of um, of an sort of collective um, identity as a, as a sort of as a, as a, as a, in, in a corporate way, that state had existed for. For, for almost two centuries. Now, we lost that um, uh, thread somewhere in the 70s, for example, and I think the best thing would have been, I was involved in the Bonn Conference, in, in, and I think uh, one th at the time nobody really thought about these things because we were all under the pressure of the, uh, of the moment. Um, but the decision to go back and adopt the Constitution of 1964 as an interim constitution um, was, was, I think, a, 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 an excellent idea and what we should have done, but we didn't go far enough. Uh, if I had my uh, uh, any say at, at the time, which I didn't, um, I would have actually gone to the government of the time and tried to restore it 
even if it takes uh, restoring uh, the monarchy, that would have really solved the problem of legitimacy, which hasn't escaped. That question of legitimacy of the Afghan state has not escaped the current government for a moment. Um, president Karzai suffered from it, even though he was there and he was the most powerful president Afghanistan has had ever. Um, but he somehow felt challenged all the time because he thought he was brought in by the Americans and, and he always had this stigma uh, with him carrying that. Whereas if we had restored the state, then we wouldn't have that. Uh, point two on, on your question is in terms of the necessity of, of, um, of consensus. There is absolutely no question. The Afghan problem uh, um, has, uh, has never really truly been an Afghan problem. Um, uh, so, so the solution will, will, will certainly not be, be an Afghan one. Right now, I think the biggest obstacle um, that stands in the way of, of uh, uh, Afghanistan finally achieving some sort of success in, in terms of this state building process is the role of Pakistan. That's the one country that has chosen to stay outside that consensus. Right now, I don't think we have, even though there are, and the uh, lady earlier asked about Iran, um, it, despite all these challenges that has existed in terms of the, um, you know, building that sort of a consensus, with the relation, difficult relationships, for example, that the United States has with countries in the region. In Iran is one of the, the, the important uh, uh, examples, but, but there are others. Russia has, is, is another one. China has, has been, has been a, a less uh, uh, so, but, but there have always been challenges. But, but in fact, when it comes to Afghanistan, the imperative of building the Afghan state, supporting the Afghan system, and making sure that Afghanistan is strong enough to withstand the threat of uh, terrorist elements there, and, and to become a stronger economy, and actually become a viable government and a vi viable state, this is something that everybody has agreed with with, again, with the exception of Pakistan, and, and I won't just go any more into that, that's a separate issue. So that, um, that, that consensus is there, uh, but there are, there, are, there, there are things, I think there are aspects that stop it, and right now I think I see the challenge of the, of the continued intransigence of Pakistan as the single biggest uh, obstacle on the way of Afghanistan achieving that opportunity to build its state. The, um, and kind of that takes me to, to your question about, about negotiations. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I think um, uh, it, it does appear that Taliban is strong, and Taliban, uh, uh, um, you know, when, if you take really their ability to uh, create violence, um, then you would be justified to assume that they are strongest than they've ever been. But I don't see the Taliban right now as, you know, maybe I'm wrong, uh, I don't see the, uh, them as um, a strategic threat anymore to the continuity of the Afghan state. Um, I think they have uh, essentially reduced themselves to a massive nuisance, um, to absolutely massive nuisance and essentially a killing machine. Um, um, but I don't see them as being able to uh, challenge uh, the, 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 the survival of the Afghan state. Uh, and, and I don't know why Shavrani has said that, but, uh, but President Ghani has uh, his own reasons for, um, for, for, you know, tactical reasons for being alarmist. Because I think for him, he sees the continue, continued engagement of the United States and NATO as being absolutely vital, not only for Afghanistan, but for his own uh, political survival. That's why he wants, he has an interest in making it look like, you know, this is very important. And I think they, you know, to some extent they're justified, but I don't see that threat. Therefore, I, I personally am not very desperate for, for the peace process. I think it's a mistake if the Afghan government sounds desperate to talk to the Taliban and bring them. I disagree with you that there isn't a, I agree that the, nobody should be bombed to extinction. Uh, but I think uh, Taliban has now, they've been in exist, some sort of an existence since the middle of 1990s, and therefore that means well over 20 years. In, in the last 20 years, they have transformed in many ways, but they have desperately failed 
to articulate some sort of a political uh, blueprint, for a sort of political reason for their existence. And they, have, they, and they will never be able to do that now or when, when they don't have. So I think if that back um, yard that they have, the, the sort of sanctuaries that they have in Pakistan, if you stop that, then I think Taliban will gradually um, uh, uh, um, uh, dry, uh, dry up. Um, but now, if you, if you ask me whether I would say no to, um, to a Taliban open letter saying that um, we're willing to talk, I would never say no. I think everybody has a... I, I was very much against uh, the uh, Hizb Islami, the Hikmatyar uh, negotiation deal. Um, however, in principle, I have absolutely no reason to say that the government should not have done that. I, I think... Um, you know, if, if people just, uh, regardless of their past, if they accept to live with a new future, to accept the, current, the, the new reality of Afghanistan and want to live with the new reality in, for a new future, then they should all be welcome. Thank you very much. Stefan, can I push you on a couple of questions? Just, I don't know which ones you were going to pick, but we had a question about um, the free market earlier on and uh, the spend on development and security. I don't know if you was I was, uh, Wonderful. was going to do it right and, 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 and a couple of them are together, and hopefully you recognize your question in my answer because I'm going to try to do it quickly. Um, the, I mean, it, you know, the, there is the, there's the element of, you know, whenever we're dealing with a country and there were questions there at the back, uh, you know, on, on terms of the international and regional settlement and political settlement. And I think that's, it's, it's elements of, of, of the question we have there directly addressed to me. You know, it's, it's obviously clear that we reach a stage where, um, you know, the, 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 there is a need for some form of political settlement and it has obviously international dimensions. But what's very striking, and, and I will, uh, you know, what's very striking is that understanding also what the local political settlement is that, that underlying it, that often then gets forgotten. You know, I can see that definitely in London, they may be very interested in, in the bigger point and the sanctuaries and the whole thing, but then what is the nature of the settlement? And it leads similarly on the development side as well, is that, you know, in, in a kind of a conflict or post-conflict setting, um, we're all very good at dreaming up the kind of the bigger picture and the amounts of aid that needs to come, but actually very poor at having a proper lens on the country itself, what would be the local economic settlement and the local um, development settlement that you kind of need. And it's, it's these things, if you, if you ask me, I'm definitely not representing the donor community, but if you ask me, is the donor community beginning to understand that, I, th I would actually say no. Um, and and it, it, it doesn't get that, that when, when we are, you know, especially when suppose there is some movement there and conversations, there may be something on Pakistan with US pressure and so on. You know, all the momentum may be there, but everybody will focus on the bigger picture, which will be the bigger picture will be on the one hand, the big international settlement and then the big aid settlement, lots of money. But actually, in terms of what we'd end up doing, we may end up doing similar things as we did there, actually misguided economic dynamic responses, because actually, it's not really thought through. I see, I, I, to be honest, I see this at the moment in lots of the thinking that's going on in Syria. You know, I can see the dollar signs in front of me and all the monies that will be done, but is anyone seriously thinking what it would mean locally how you build up an economy again? And I'm not saying it should be protection or not and free market or not, but it should have a very careful, both the local political economy lens, a local, local politics lens, and a local economic and development lens that they actually have. And I also think, in general, that we often miss these opportunities beforehand to really start thinking what would that detail mean? Because we all get very obsessed with that uh, seemingly that moment of there is a moment now when we can declare the end of a conflict or a temporary settlement or a negotiation where actually it's the detail behind it that I worry. Why does the donor community doesn't uh, wake up to that? Well, you know, during the conflict situation, I still remain with this point. If it's led by on military interest, then, then the aid community is just running behind it and has to carry the bags and has to bring the bags of money or whatever it is. Um, is it, and, and, and one, but in general, is just too much impatience. You know, just the impatience of trying to understand properly 
what actually is going on and actually saying let's actually go slowly on certain things because we need to get it right not not over being over ambitious too quickly de delivering some kind of massive peace dividend i know other people saying you need to win immediately that peace but i feel like if we look at the evidence i can't think of any country beyond sierra leone where we actually arguably have done something reasonable in post-conflict settings and uh and and so it is that having that good understanding and knowing what the local settlement is. I just finally want to say something on the aid in the corruption. I've not much to say. You know, I, I, I do think, I don't think it is the case that aid by necessity causes corruption, but I can't help but have, and I, I can't deny that aid does provide some of the fuel and the liquidity for corruption. Uh, and it allows it to grow, blossom, and do all kinds of things. And that's not because it's something to do with aid, but it's because it's a big pot of resources that's there, and the rent seekers will be able to find ways of getting it. Final word to you. Uh, coming to the, to the issue of uh, um, uh, state uh, transformation and continuity in Afghanistan, we had some sort of continuity in the existing state institutions for a long time. And, but the problem not, was not with that. The problem was that those institutions were ineffective. It was ineffective in the past and after 2001. So what happened uh, somehow the process reinforced? Uh, I mean, uh, the politics of patronage and uh, those uh, weaknesses that the state inherited. Coming to the point of, uh, especially after uh, 2014, uh, that, that's a very good question. Did, uh, did we reduce fragility or, or not? Uh, well, uh, the answer, I think, would be no. And uh, Af Afghanistan is yet suffering from, or is in a situation of fragility. And uh, th that brings us to another, another question, um, both uh, concerning expenditure and also uh, the context, because Afghanistan is not another um, country uh, being in another part of the world, because most of the challenges the country is facing is beyond the capacity of a state to address narcotic. It's like a global challenge. Now, uh, terrorism, so what happened during 9-11 in Afghanistan? So uh, it requires massive investment. So if we take Afghanistan and put it in another place, let's say replace Bangladesh with Afghanistan. So then there will be the question, uh, and perhaps Afghanistan will do much, much better with, with the given conditions. So uh, th th that's another aspect of, but uh, there was over-reliance on security, and uh, out of this, the, the, the period I'm discussing, uh, about 50% of aid was spent on um, security sector, even the national budget, and uh, now uh, above 35 or around 35 percent is spent on security. And also that's necessary um, in terms of the argument. If there is no security, how can you protect the schools and uh, clinics and so on? So, but what we needed uh, was a balance between long-term development uh, um, agenda and uh, uh, what we needed to invest in the area of security. Um, in terms of the... Um, uh, private sector, uh, so one of the biggest challenges we had was approaching Afghanistan um, within, the, uh, uh, within the ideological context or uh, framework of like, as, um, so we need to promote uh, a free market or market economy in Afghanistan. Uh, that somehow neglected the, the, the context and the realities on the ground. I give you the example of one of the factories. We had this publishing company the, uh, to this, the Ministry of Education, or Morif, Madbe Morif. And we needed around, uh, there was need around um, close to a few million dollars to, to, to rebuild that and that factory could print uh, textbooks. But it was refused because that was uh, a part of the government ministry. But then there was a decision to print all the textbooks outside Afghanistan. And hundreds of millions of uh, dollars were spent. But by the end of the day, we didn't build up the, the capacity we needed to, to sustain the process. So that was one of, one of the major um, challenge in terms of like uh, uh, the orientation but yet we are suffering from the same problem now so
sometimes I'm worrying why things are going on and on. We are replicating the same problems that we were facing uh, in 2004 and five. We have some of our colleagues, uh, we work together in the finance ministry, Dr. Zubair, jo uh, Ahmed Jawed, and uh, Habib. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's the challenge. Um, how can we, we rethink and fix uh, when it comes to policy making and also um, somehow uh, aid allocation in the country? Wonderful. Well, look, um, I want to, on your behalf, thank all three of our speakers this evening. Um, it's been a rich discussion. I know there were more questions, but we are going to draw things to a close now. Um, I hope that the discussion has teased out for you some of the key lessons from this very interesting book. Someone said earlier on it's excellent to have uh, a distinctive and clear voice reflecting on Afghanistan's experience, having lived it. And I should have said more clearly in my introduction um, that Namad um, held a number of um, senior posts. So he writes not only as somebody with uh, distinguished academic credentials, but also somebody who's lived a lot of that experience. I can't recommend this book highly enough to you. It, it is a challenge to all of us to think, as this discussion has provoked us to do, about the lessons that we can take from Afghanistan's experience. And as was made powerfully um, uh, in the comments from Mr. Ludin, making sure that the lessons that Afghanistan can offer the rest of the world are taken on board. So if we at the Balatnik School can be any part in that, we'd want to be along with you and other partners. But for this evening, I want on your behalf to thank all of our speakers for their rich contribution and, and particularly to Namat for bringing us together and for writing his excellent book. Thank you all very much. Thank you.